I open my mouth to the Lord and I won't turn back, no, I will go, I shall go to see what the end is going to be. She does not know her beauty. She thinks her brown body has no glory. If she could dance naked under palm trees and see her image in the river, she would know. But there are no palm trees on the street, and dishwater gives back no images. Mm, mm, mm. So I open my mouth to the Lord, and I won't turn back, no, I will go on, shall go well. Once, riding in old Baltimore, head filled, heart filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now, I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled. <laughs> but he stuck out his tongue and called me, nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. Mm -hmm. But I open my mouth to the Lord and I won't turn back, no, I will go, I shall go to see what the end is going to be. I shall thank you. Yes, I hit it. That's it. Uh, in sincerity and in seriousness, I know that uh, a poetry reading seems, for the most part, like a pretty dull, you know, I mean, really. You know, people say, well, where are you going tonight? Well, I'm going to the Hippodrome, <laughs> taking my chances. <laughs> and other people say, oh, I, oh, I'm staying home with a friend, a good friend. <laughs> and so when you say to somebody, I'm going to Lewisham to a poetry reading. <laughs> People have got to say, ooh. <laughs> poetry is asked to be magical, mystical, lyrical, and musical. Now, before I get into the written poetry, that is the published poetry, I'll just let you look at a couple of phrases from folk songs. There's a 19th century folk song in which a black man speaks of the woman he loves. He said, the woman I love is fat and chocolate to the bone. <laughs> and every time she shakes, some skinny woman loses her home. <laughs> now that's poetry. There's a line, 19th century. This shred of the, of the folk song found its way into Mr. W.C. Handy's 20th century blues, St. Louis blues a black woman speaking of the man she loves. She said, he's blacker than midnight, teeth like flags of truth. <laughs> he's the finest thing in the whole St. Louis. They say the blacker the berry. Sweeter is the Jew. <laughs> that's poetry. <laughs> and that's love poetry, too. Now, to look at the written poetry, I like to go to Miss Georgia Douglas Johnson. I love to talk about love, about all sorts of love, but not much. I mean, sentimentality to uh, love. Romantic love, agape love, sensual love, familial love, and self-love. So 
So I hope you brought everything you need because for the next four or five hours, I just thought, you know, I would stick to it. <laughs> Miss Georgia Douglas Johnson, who wrote, I want to die while you love me, while yet you hold me fair, while laughter lies upon my lips and lights are in my hair, yes. <laughs> I want to die while you love me. Who would care to live till love had nothing more to ask? and nothing more to give, no. I want to die while you love me and bear to that still bed your kisses, turbulent, unspent, to warm me while I'm dead. Hmm? James Weldon Johnson, writing in 1916, wrote, the glory of the day was in her face. The beauty of the night was in her eyes and over all her loveliness the grace of morning blushing in the early sky and it seemed like to me that everything is wrong seemed like to me the birds done lost their song seemed like to me the days are just twice as long since she went away seemed like to me i just can't help but sigh seemed like to me my throat keeps getting Seem like to me a tear stay in my eye since she went away. See, the glory of the day was in her face. In her face. In her face. James Weldon Johnson. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, writing in 1892, wrote a poem called A Negro Love Song. Mr. Dunbar puts the poem in a man's voice, but this is a woman's poem. The refrain in the poem is, jump back, honey, jump back. Seen my lady home last night, jump back, honey, jump back. Held her hand and squeezed it tight, jump back, honey, jump back. I heard her sigh, that little sigh, saw that light gleam in her eye, saw a smile go flitting by. I said, jump back, honey, jump back. Hey, the mockingbird was singing. Fine, jump back, honey, jump back. And my heart was beating so that when I reached my lady's door, <laughs> I just couldn't bear to go. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> so I put my arms around her waist. <laughs> jump back, honey, jump back. <laughs> I raised her lips and took a taste. Jump back, honey, jump back. I said, love me, honey, do you love me true? You love me as well as I love you? And then she answered, of course I do, but jump back. <laughs> Love poetry. Mm. The, the books are filled with the love poetry, the black American love poetry. I mean, from the 19th and the 20th centuries. There's a poem Nikki Giovanni wrote, a love poem, romantic. It says, one of these days, <clears throat> you're going to walk in this house and I'm going to be wearing that long African gown. And you, not noticing me at all, will say, the problem in this country, and I'm going to be taking that gown off and licking your arm. You will go on as you always do. What we ought to do about the struggle and I will be unbuckling your belt and taking down your pants. You, not noticing me at all, will say, I want to talk to the brothers. I've got to talk to the... And then you will notice your state of undress. And knowing you, you will probably turn to me and say, Hey, Nikki, but isn't this counter-revolutionary? <laughs> to look at love, though, all the versions of love, there is the, the need to see, um, well, love for what might seem to be unlovable. You all know that uh, black Americans for 
centuries were obliged to laugh when they weren't tickled and to scratch when they didn't itch. And those gestures have come down to us as Uncle Tommy. However, I believe people live in direct relation to the heroes and sheroes they have, always and in all ways. And I don't think we often enough stop to wonder, how did that black man feel when his throat would start to ache? And every person in this auditorium knows that feeling. When you must cry, but you won't, and you hold yourself, and then these muscles get sore. Each time that black man had to say, yes, sir, boss, you're right, I must be stupid, yes, sir. So he could make enough money so he could go home and feed somebody. Or that black woman who said, no, ma'am, Miss Ann, you didn't hurt me when you slapped me. I ain't tender hearted, it sure ain't, no, ma'am. So she could make enough money so she could go home and send somebody to school. I think that we live in direct relation to the heroes and sheroes we have. And sometime at some place inside our hearts, we've got to say thank you. Because I don't know about any of you, but I wouldn't be here this evening had those people not been successful in the humiliating employment of those humiliating ploys. Yes, sir. So, so, I honor them, and in honoring them, I honor all our ancestors who tried to stay alive and be somebody so that we could be here this evening and try to accept that we've been loved, each of us, maybe by somebody three generations ago who never even thought what name you would carry, that they paid for you already. To look at that condition, I wrote a poem about a woman who is a maid in New York City. She sits at the back of the bus with two shopping bags, black. If the bus stops abruptly, she says, ah, <laughs> If it stops slowly, <laughs> picks up somebody, <laughs> misses somebody, <laughs> I watched her for about nine months. And I thought, if you don't know black features, you may think that woman is laughing. She wasn't laughing. She was simply extending her lips and making a sound. <laughs> I thought, oh, I see. That's that survival apparatus at work. So I wrote a poem for her. I use it with Mr. Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, Mask, and my own poem for old black men. This is love. When I think about myself, <laughs> I almost laugh myself to death. <laughs> my life has been one great big joke a dance that's walked, a song that spoke. <laughs> I laugh so hard, I nearly choke when I think about myself. Seventy years in these folks' world, the child I works for calls me girl. I say, <laughs> yes, ma'am, for working sake. I'm too proud to bend and too poor to break, so <laughs> I laugh until my stomach ache when I think about myself. My folks can make me split my side. I laugh so hard, I nearly died. <laughs> the tales they tell sound just like lying. They grow the fruit. I eat the rind. <laughs> I laugh <laughs> until I start to cry when I think about myself and my folks <laughs> and the little children. But we wear the mask that grins and lies 
It shades our cheeks and hides our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh my God, our tears to thee from tortured souls arise. <laughs> oh, we sing, hey, baby, hey, baby, hey, baby, hey, baby. But oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. <laughs> Let the world think otherwise. We wear the mask. My fathers sit on benches. Their flesh count every plank. The slats leave dents of darkness deep in their withered flank, and they nod like broken candles, all waxed and burnt profound. They say, but baby, it was our submission, and that made your world go round. There, in those pleated faces, I see the auction block, the chains and slavery's coffles, the whip and lash and stock. My father speak in voices that shred my fact and sound. They say, but sugar, it was our submission. That made your world go round. They laughed to shield their crying. They uh, shuffled through their dreams. They step and fetched a country and wrote the blues in screams. I understand their meaning. It could and did derive from living on the ledge of death. They kept my race alive by wearing a mask. <laughs> See, that too is love, Leslie. That is love. When any human being is willing to allow herself or himself to be seen at the most debased level, most demeaned, most dehumanized level, thinking that by doing so, he or she can assure the survival of yet another human being, that is love. How be it bitter, brutal, Painful, that too is love. Now, uh, to look at, well, self-love. I'm very keen about self-love, very. Well, because there's an African saying, which is, be careful when a naked person offers you a shirt. I mean, if the person had any clothes, he'd put his thumb on himself first, right? So I never trust anybody who says, I love you, and the person doesn't love herself or himself. How can he? How can you give something you don't have? So I always encourage self-love. That's why I sometimes think we ought to deal with that first. You must find something wondrous, the uniqueness of one's own self to remind us that each of us is worthy. Some years ago, I wrote a play in New York, um, and it, it, uh, I'd written the book, the lyric, the music, and we were to open. And the night before we were to open, the producer, who had all the money, to <laughs> told me that the, the play needed a work song. So there was no time to whimper or whine or even be cross. I just wrote a work song. I wanted to write about men and women working together because that to me is healthy. So I wrote, there ain't no pay beneath the sun, sweet as rest when a job's well done. I was born to work, 
up to my grave but i was not born to be a slave one more round let's heave it down one more round let's heave it down Papa drove steel, mama stood guard. Never heard them holler cause the work was hard. They were burrowing to work. It goes on there about 98 verses. <laughs> well, when I heard the professional singer sing it, I realized I had written a man's work song. I mean, I had simply put women in the lyric, but it was a traditional tote that barge and a whack tone boom and a duke and all that. Now, you know. I don't knock that, it's just that I didn't mean to write a man's work song. I wanted a man and woman's work song. So I decided to try to write a woman's work song, looking at how fantastic we are. So, I thought of that cliche that men may work from sun to sun if they can find jobs, but women's work is never done. So I wrote, I've got the children to tend, the clothes to mend, the floor to mop, the food to shop, then the chicken to fry, the baby to dry, I got company to feed, the garden to weed, I got the shirts to press, the tops to dress, the cane to be cut, I got to clean up this hut, then see about the sick, then the cotton to pick. Shine on me, sunshine. <laughs> rain on me, rain. Fall softly, do drops and cool my brow again. Storm, blow me from here with your fiercest wind. Let me float across the sky till I can rest again because I have got to see about those people's pool. No, no. I got to get to the school. No, no. Oh, I got to pick up the mail. No, no. I got to visit the jail. No. I got to pick up. <laughs> Too true. <clears throat> this is a poem called Weekend Glory. I think you'll, only one thing, there's a first line that says, some dicty folks. Dicty is a black American southern word meaning hinkty, <laughs> which means sadity, <laughs> which is a word sort of meaning snobbish, haughty. Some dicty folks don't know the fact posing and preening and putting on acts, stretching the necks and straining their backs. They move into condos up over the ranks, lend their souls to the local banks, buy big cars they can't afford, then ride around town acting bored. <laughs> my job at the plant ain't the biggest bet, but I pay my bills and stay out of debt. I get my hair done for my own self's sake, so I don't have to pick and I don't have to rake. I take the church money out, then I head across town to my friend girl's house where we plan our round. We meet our men and go to a joint where the music is blues and to the point. <laughs> Folks talk about me, they just can't see how I work all week at the factory, then get spruced up and laugh and dance and turn away from worry with a sassy glance. They accuse me of living from day to day. Who are they kidding? So are they. My life ain't heaven, but it sure ain't hell. I'm not on top, but I call it swell. If I'm able to work and get paid right and have the luck to be black on a Saturday night. Hey! Self-love is very important. You got to look at yourself and like it. Now, <clears throat> I've written a poem for uh, women because we are so phenomenal. <laughs> yes. Now, I wrote this poem for black women. I wrote it for Asian women. 
I wrote it for Hispanic women, Native American women. I wrote it for women in the kibbutzim, kibbutzim of Israel and in Palestinian concentration camps. I wrote it for all women. We have not even begun to test our potential, but it's there. It's there. We have a wonderful promise. Now, I know that men are as phenomenal as women. I know that because I know that nature abhors imbalance. Like you, I have been told that 98% of all the species which have lived on this little blob of spit and sand are now extinct because they got out of balance. We are still here, which proves to me that we are in some balance. Men are as phenomenal as women. I will only say this to the men in the audience. You will have to write your own poem. This one is fresh. I wrote it for fat women, very fat, those who hate their sizes but will do nothing about it except call a friend in the middle of the night and say, girl, there's a skinny woman still trying to get out. And I wrote it for fat women who love their sizes and who are the epitome of sensuality when they walk down the street. I wrote it for skinny women, those who deserve all our sympathy. I wrote it for all. <laughs> That's it. Many people wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. When I try to show them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenal. I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and to a man the fellows stand, or fall down on their knees, <laughs> and then they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, oh, it's the fire in my eyes, the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist, the joy in my feet. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, oh, it's in the arch of my back. <laughs> and now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk too loud. When you see me walking, it ought to make you proud. I say it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hands, the need for my care, because I'm a woman. Phenomenally, phenomenal woman. That's my mother and all your mothers. And then my grandmothers and all your grandmothers and my great grandmothers and your great grandmothers and my great 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 and your great 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 and all you women here and me. I started out with romantic love, and uh, I think I will look at love, romantic love again. Uh, they went home and told their wives that never once in all their lives had they met a girl like me. but they went home. <laughs> my praises were on all men's lips. They liked my smile, my wit, my hips. They'd spend one night or two or three, but
Well, I began to wonder, having written that, it's a little longer poem than that, but what, I mean, I began to wonder about some of the men, not any of the people in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know that none of you all are doing that. But, <clears throat> I mean, what was it that, that would make a man play so cavalierly with a lady's heart and other parts of the anatomy? I wonder, <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> so. <laughs> now, you know, gentlemen, none of you this is not signifying at all, no sir, uh-uh. <laughs> so I wrote an, another little poem, <clears throat> trying to look at it from the man's point of view. There's a long-legged girl in San Francisco by the Golden Gate. She said she'd give me all I wanted, but I just couldn't wait. I started to picking them up and laying them down, picking them up and laying them down picking them up and laying them down and getting to the next town, baby. Now, picking them up and laying them down is a black American phrase meaning walking. You know, it's picking them up and laying. And then it means however you, you know, whatever you. <laughs> <clears throat> I met that lovely Detroit lady and thought my time had come. But just before I said I do, I said I got to run and started to picking them up and laying them down. Picking them up and laying them down. Picking them up and laying them down and getting to the next town, baby. There's a pretty brown in Birmingham. Man, she's little and cute. But when I, she tried to tie me down, I had to grab my suit and start to picking them up and laying them down and picking them up and laying them down and picking them up and laying them down and getting to the next town, baby. There ain't no words for what I feel about a pretty face. But if I stay, I just might miss a prettier one someplace. That's why I start that picking them up and laying them down, and picking them up and laying them. Now, men, you know I'm not talking about you. <laughs> well, I thank you very much for your hospitality, which is truly southern. <laughs> now, I know that Lewisham is south, but. It's, uh, it's not quite North Carolina, but I really thank you. And I would remind you of a wonderful African saying, which is, the trouble for the thief is not how to steal the chief's bugle, but where to blow it. <laughs> the issues which face us all are not just how to survive, Obviously, we are doing that somehow. But really, how to thrive. Really. Thrive with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. This poem is called, And Still I Rise. Now, every person in this auditorium has gone to sleep one night or another or gone to bed one night or another with fear or pain or loss or terror, unhappiness, grief, insecurity. And yet each of us has awakened, arisen, seen another human being and said, morning, how are you? Fine, thanks, and you? <laughs> Now, wherever that abides, whether it's behind the kneecap or in the bend of the elbow or between the teeth, wherever that is, lives, there we will find our nobleness. Not nobility, I think that's a pompous word, but the nobleness of the human spirit, that we rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just cause I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. <laughs> Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken? bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops 
weakened by my soulful cries. Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh as if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness, but just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh. <laughs> Does it come as a surprise that I dance? As if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. <laughs> Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling and bearing in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And so, wow, there I go.